Good evening, at least here in Northern Ireland. Uh, welcome to our midweek Bible study for Calvary Bay Valley. Uh, as we are looking at the Psalms, going through the Psalms tonight, we will be in Psalm 30. So open your Bibles to Psalm 30 and uh, prepare to get your socks ble <laughs> blessed off. Does that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, we pray to get blessed by this psalm. Um, I've entitled this, uh, this, this, this uh, study in Psalm 30, From Sad to Glad. And that right there should give you a, an encouraging heart. So uh, let's pray for the Lord to anoint his word and to minister it to our hearts. So Father, we pray that you would Bless the going forth of your word. Lord, we are proclaiming the eternal word of God. This word which is alive, which is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. So Lord, we pray that you would um, insert your word into our lives. And Lord, that you would make this word alive, Father, I pray that you speak to us by your Spirit as you empower and impact the Word to us tonight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Psalm 30 uh, does give us a little background to it, which sets the stage for it and helps with the understanding of, of uh, this, this psalm. Because the psalm begins that it's a psalm of David. So we know who wrote it, and we know why it was written, and about kind of when, um, because it says um, this is a song to the, or a song at the dedication of the temple. So we know that this was written by David when he was king, because um, the temple was... Um, well, it was something that was on his heart. You know, we read in, uh, you know, in the Bible that uh, when he was king, when he's established in Jerusalem, when he was king over all Israel, uh, he had the tabernacle moved from where it was in the field and eventually moved into Jerusalem. But then he saw this thing and he thought, that's kind of sad. You know, here I am, I've got a beautiful palace that has been built for me. It's just gorgeous and excellent. Yet God's living out there in a tent. we got to do something about this. You know, he asked the prophet Nathan, what do you think, buddy, if we, uh, about building the temple for the Lord? And uh, his prophet, his friend, his advisor said, well, sounds good to me. Let's go for it. But as Nathan was walking out the door, the Lord, hey, wait a minute. You didn't seek me. Go back and tell David, it's not my will for him to build the temple because he's a man of war and he has blood on his hands. So Nathan had to go back and say, hey there, Mr. King, uh, buddy, got a message from the Lord for you. <laughs> and uh, it is, sorry, but the Lord doesn't want you to build the temple for him. Your son will build it. But he also had very, very good news from the Lord. Because the Lord made a covenant with David and said, You will always have a descendant on the throne. Your dynasty will last forever. Because someone is coming from your throne who will be, he didn't say it in his words and all, all that, but who will be the savior of the world. So, uh, you know, from bad news, good news to bad news to good news. And so, though it was on David's heart to build a temple, he didn't actually build it. So this makes this psalm really interesting because it's titled, This is a Psalm, a song at the, the dedication of the temple. So this psalm was written by faith. It was written to be, uh, to be sung, because it's a song, written to be sung after his death, when the temple is built, 
and is being dedicated to the Lord. So it's very interesting, and that sets the tone for this for this uh, for this for this psalm. But you know, as you read through the psalm, it is an odd choice to me for uh, for the purpose that it's meant for. You would think that a psalm for the dedication of the Lord, Lord's temple, would be full of wild praise and excitement and glory in God. But this psalm, this psalm is a bit of a downer. So, you know, maybe, maybe as a song, uh, it was sung up-tempo to get a little life into it. But it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's not what you'd expect the Lord to inspire his prophet David to prepare for uh, the dedication of the temple. It is uh, a, a, a song that declares the awesome power of the Lord, you know. And the temple was seen as the place where God dwells. The temple then is where the presence of the Lord is. We know now since the Messiah has come and died for our sins and offers us redemption and new life through faith in him, um, as he died for our sins and gives us new life. And when we accept that new life through Jesus, we become born again. And guess what? The Holy Spirit, at that moment we accept Jesus, dwells in us. In, in dwells in us. Because we are called, believers are called as individuals, the temple of the Lord because mysteriously and beautifully the Holy Spirit dwells inside us but at that time they didn't have this blessing this privilege and though they knew the Lord was everywhere the temple and before that the tabernacle was seen as the place where the Lord dwells where his presence is they were to pray uh, toward the temple, to the temple, even in their mind, we are praying to the Lord as we are praying to the temple. So this song to the dedication of the temple has in mind uh, to, to get our thoughts focused onto God, focused onto his presence. And it means so much more as Christians to know that his presence is actually in us as well as us living in his presence, as all people do. Um, and so their thoughts are raised to the Lord. You know, as you look at the temple, it was, a, it was an awe-inspiring building, tall and glistening with white marble stone and gold doors and, you know, with all the beauty and everything inside. It, it, it was just... Uh, a really an awe-inspiring thought. And as worshipers would come to the temple, you know, look up to this big building, their thoughts, their hearts would be lifted up, enlarged up to the Lord. And so this is a psalm of thanks and praise to the Lord who answers our prayers that are directed to Him and directed to their... Uh, the temple was actually dedicated by David's son, Solomon, who became king after David died. And we read of Solomon's prayer on the day of dedication of the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, um, in ver especially verses 27 through 30. I'll paraphrase some of the thoughts that Solomon had because they really apply to this prayer. This prayer, this Psalm 30 became sort of a template. I think that was definitely in Solomon's mind as he prayed this prayer of dedication. Uh, verse 27, he said, will God dwell on earth? You know, the God who is everywhere, will he dwell with us in this, you know, in this building? Uh, the next verse he said, as he pleads to the Lord to, to have regard, to, to pay attention to the prayers of first 
himself to your servant, Solomon said, and that in the next verse, that your eyes may be on this place, the place where you have said, my name shall be there. Well, that's a bit powerful when you think as Christians, with the, God's place is in us, his name is in us, we bear his name, Christians. <laughs> Christians. Um, that, but then verse 30 of this chapter, Solomon ends this section with this. He said, listen to the prayers of your servant and of your people, Israel. Listen in heaven, which is your true dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Hmm. Okay, so this psalm, I've broken down into five sections. Uh, verses 1 through 3, the first section is, I'm calling it God's protection and deliverance. The next section, section 2, verses 4 and 5, are the joy of his salvation. Third section, verses 7 and the first half of, or 6 and the first half of 7, is strength of the good times. The next section is the hardship of the bad times. And the final section, the last three verses, is, oh, how God changes things. <laughs> like I said, it's, it, it's, you know, well titled, I think, calling this from this psalm from sad to glad. And then I'll repeat these sections as we go there so you remember if you're taking notes or anything. So this first section. We read verses 1 through 3. This I had called God's protection and deliverance. And the key line is, you restored me to life. And it says this. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have restored me to life that I should not go down to the pit. Now, you see what I mean about kind of an odd psalm for the dedication of the temple? But yet, what's it doing? He's drawing our thoughts to the Lord. He's reflecting on what the Lord actively works in our lives. It's not just a God of, you know, ideas or concepts or things. It's, it's a God who actively works in our life, who is a partner with our lives and takes part in us. So it is applicable for this. This is the practical working out of God's, God's presence in our life. And the actual working out, really, of salvation, of God protecting us. Well, in this first verse, it says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. You're probably wondering, like I did, what this word extol means. And it simply means to be lifted on high. Um, he's basically, I lift up your name. You know, we sing that a lot in worship songs, and we see it in the Psalms in that. Um, so, I lift you up, again, with the temple, this building looming up before them. Oh, I lift you up, O oh God, because you have drawn me up. Now, that draw me up is a, another term that's a little, it's not used much, only about five or six times in the Old Testament, and it means to be lifted up, but in a little different way. It's actually taken as, as a, a bucket in a well is lifted up. So it's like you're taking water out of the well, you're drawing it up out of the water. You're, you know, he's grabbing your life and protecting you. The first time this, this term was used was in Exodus uh, chapter 2, when Moses uh, fled Egypt and ended up in Midian and there it was at the well of uh, in Midian and he saw all these these uh, girls coming up and um, 
they were coming up to, as it says in verse 16, they came and drew water and filled the trough to water their father's flock. Moses came and saw this, and some bullies came uh, trying to edge these girls out of the way. You know, so they man as well. Uh, you know, what girls can do this here? Moses, you know, typical as he was, he chased these guys off and let the girls be able to draw their water. So they were pretty thrilled with this, you know, this, you know, strong young Egyptian that came and protected them. <laughs> but anyway, so you see, it's drawing up. And so it, it's great like this. You know, and basically what the psalmist is saying, it says, I lift you up, Lord, because you have lifted me up out of trouble. Beautiful, isn't it? You know, God's moving in our lives. Um, you know, he lift, lifts us up out of the well, out of trouble. Um, I, I just instantly go to another favorite psalm of mine, Psalm 40. Verse 2 says, he brought me up. Also, out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. Same type of things. He drew us up. He rescued us. He pulled us out of trouble. He lifted us up. Uh, verse 2 says, O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have heard me. You remember Solomon's prayer? How we ask the Lord to, when we pray to you, to listen. Hear us, Lord, when we pray. And when you hear, forgive us. <laughs> because so often that's what we're asking for. We're asking for help and we're realizing uh, we need help. But it's worded in a different way. It says, um, uh, I cried out for your help and you have healed me. Isn't that a beautiful, precious term? You know, uh, as one commentator, old-time commentator said, uh, affliction is often described as a disease. And so relief of this is by healing. You know, when we're afflicted, when we're in trouble, it's like having a disease. And when he rescues us from trouble, it's like being healed from that disease. Uh, again, another psalm mentions, uh, mentions this, kind of gives a better idea about this in using healing. Psalm 107, verses 19 through 21 say this. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Indeed, he healed them out of their distress. He had healed David. He's looking at this as a problem, maybe a specific problem, or just problems in general. And he healed him, too, of his distress, of his trouble, and his discouragement. Oh, Lord, heal us from these things. Verse 3 said, O Lord, you have brought up, again that term again, brought up my soul from Sheol, the place of the dead. You restored me to life that I should not go down to the pit. You know, this is the term of, of someone who is in extreme danger. The Lord, in effect, delivered him from the edge of death. It was a serious problem that he was in. And it said, you have, you have kept me alive. You have uh, restored me to life, as the ESV put it, uh, and delivered me from the pit. It was like being saved from the state of dying, reviving, being brought back to life from the edge of death. This was a serious problem he was in. And the Lord rescued him, delivered him, healed him from this trouble. Uh, to get an idea of this, uh, another psalm uses this type of term, Psalm 28 and verse 1. To you, O Lord, I call, my rock. Do not be deaf 
deaf to me, lest, if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. It's like, save me, this is so bad, I think I'm going to die. Oh, we sometimes say that in, in jest. We certainly feel like when we're in the midst of trouble, he says, oh, I'm dying here. <laughs> well, this literally <laughs> happening to David, he was really feeling like he was, he was, you know, being delivered from the edge of death. But there was someone else who was in this type of state, who was literally in this, um, who, who, who um, was brought up, his soul was brought up from Sheol and restored to life that should not go down in the pit. And that person was Jesus. This here in this place, this psalm becomes a bit of a, a prophetic psalm about the Messiah. One of those messianic uh, terms that we have talked about in Psalms. To give you a sense of this, in um, the second chapter of Acts, when Peter is preaching to the crowd that came because they heard this noise and heard the people speaking praises to God in their own languages from all around the world when the Holy Spirit had baptized them in his presence. Then P Peter used the opportunity, uh, filled with the Spirit, to, to preach to them. And among the things he says in verse 24 was talking about Jesus, God raised him up, loosening him, from the pains of death, because it was not possible for death to keep him in its grip. Uh, during this time, Peter also went on to quote from another psalm of David, Psalm 16. And he said, David, being a prophet, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he must not be abandoned to Hades, as Sheol was called in the Greek nor did his flesh see corruption. So Christ, too, was brought up from Sheol, from Hades, from the place of the death, that he might not stay in the pit of death. So praise the Lord. That's the first section. What did I call that? God's protection and deliverance. Now, section two, um, the joy of his salvation. The key verse being a precious one to us, joy comes with the morning. And these verses 4 and 5 say this, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For in his anger, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Woohoo! I like that. His anger is but for a moment, but his favor is is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. And that's morning as in dawn of a new day. <laughs> Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Now this sounds to me like a song more fitting for the dedication to the temple. And this is as good as it gets in that regard. But it's, this is a great one. Um, so the, the, this verse 2 is also a, a, the, a right response for what the deliverance God offers for healing us from our distress. Distresses. Uh, for this is giving thanks to the deliverance that God has in his life. You know, and we, when that happens... To us, like the psalmist, we sing praises to the Lord and give thanks to his holy name. As it says, O oh, you his saints, his special called apart ones, sing praises. And we do so, if not out loud in our mind or in our heart at least, and we give thanks to his holy name. And speaking of holy... Psalm 22 and verse 3 says this. And I love how this is put. Now Psalm 22 is a definite messianic psalm. It goes on cringeworthy verses to describe crucifixion um, and what happens to a person in, in, in detail. But 
in verse 3, as the psalm is just getting going, it says, But you are holy, you who inhabits the praises of Israel. When we praise the Lord and we give thanks to him, when we, as it says here, sing praises to the Lord and give thanks to his holy name, he lives, he inhabits those praises. Something is special when you worship the Lord, when you praise the Lord. He's in the midst of that. It's just a beautiful thought. He inhabits the praises um, of the Lord. But in the original Hebrew, it doesn't actually say, give thanks to his holy name. Um, it says this. It says, uh, remember his holiness. Which I think is a beautiful thing too. And that is the point of like this dedication to the temple is remembering God. And we remember, in this case, His holiness. It's good to remember the Lord. What do you think when you remember the Lord? Does it, when you remember the Lord, do you think, oh, He preserved my life. He saved me. You know, if we had a big church and big congregation, I could stop and say, raise your hand, what's something you remember the Lord for? We might say things like, oh, we remember his love that doesn't change. We remember his, his, his patience towards us, his long-suffering towards us. We remember his kindness to us by his kindness, his loving kindness led us to salvation. So it's good to remember the Lord. It's good to remember who he is, especially in the sad times, in the dark times, in the difficult times. Because, uh, you know, verse 5 is, is beautiful too. It's sort of, it's this psalm, it's just line after line, it just changes and goes and moves. Verse 5 said, For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Especially to the one who's been saved. You know, when he got saved, his anger against you was stopped because you accepted the sacrifice of Jesus that satisfied that anger for sin that God had. Because God is not angry at us personally. He is angry at sin. And he was angry at the sinner. He's angry at the actions of sin. But especially for the believer, God is not angry ever angry at us but he is angry at sin because he's holy and he knows well sin affects us and he hates its his anger angry at his uh, effects the effects of sin uh, again another psalm psalm 103 verse 17 says but the steadfast love of the lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and get this and his righteousness to his children's children god's righteousness upon us has replaced his anger towards sin in us how beautiful when we think about sin and what we've done it makes us sad so you know we're sorry for what we've done and we're sorry uh, for things and sometimes God has to has to uh, you know is training us for righteousness and brings in things that make us sad that makes us difficult in that that's why it says though weeping may tarry or only you know last for the night but joy comes with the morning it just gives the idea of just sort of that that weeping that sadness is a short time but it's, to, it's replaced quickly. Morning comes. Light comes back in our lives. And it's replaced by joy. Uh, again, this is kind of looking at the Messiah. Because Jesus said something to his, his disciples. In John 16, he said this speaking to his disciples, speaking of his death, 
and then his resurrection, his rising from the dead. He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy, and no one will take your joy from you. So for our lives, you know, weeping over our sins, you know, tarried, lasted through the night, but joy came in the morning with the dawning of the sun, S-O-N, <laughs> the Son of God in our lives. Uh, and times of refreshing came. Well, section three sort of follows along with this. This is the one I called the strength of good times. Key verse, verse you made my mountain stand strong. Verses 6 and 7 say this. Uh, I'll read all of verse 7, though we'll look at the first half, and then the second half of 7 will go into the next section. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. Boop! You hid your face, and I was dismayed. You know, it's, it's kind of odd in there. Again, this is a song. You know, it's it, it. Sometimes the lyrics of a song sound different, read on a page, and very different with this. But this is a, a was a Hebrew song, so you know that one, big change. But anyway, so we'll look at the good part, the first half. Um, As for me, I said of my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord. You made my mountain stand strong. Now, I don't think David here is being proud or being puffed up or being arrogant or like, you know, ha, 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 you know, I was prospered. I, my mountain is strong. I was as solid as a rock, you know. I couldn't be moved. I was, you know, <laughs> oops, I was there. Um, but, but he's not rubbing our nose in it. He's just stating the facts. And... He's giving the Lord credit for this strength, as we all should. For the good times, we've got to give the Lord the credit. It's not by our own might that we succeed. It's by the Lord helping us, leading us, showing us, um, inspiring us. So it says, by your favor, Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. I was solid as a rock. I didn't slip. You know, nothing could affect me. Nothing happened to me. The storms may come and I stood strong because your favor was on me. But just as much, um, the, you know, it's just as much you're just as strong when things aren't so prosperous, things aren't so good. God's favor is still on us. For we look at the third sec fourth section, the hardship of the bad times. This key verse in this that is, I was dismayed. So, from the second half of verse 7 through 9, we read, You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit, or if I go to corruption? Will the dead dust praise you? Will it tell? Will it tell of your faithfulness? So it says, you hid your face. I was dismayed. Yeah, when those times had come, when the Lord just doesn't seem to be there, when um, we don't have the sense of the Lord's presence, we don't feel, we feel like he's abandoned us. You know, difficulties have come. Uh, you know, uh, temptations were too overwhelming. Trials are, are so difficult. It's like, God, where are you? I need you. This is what I need you the most. But you're, you're hiding your face from me. You're not here. And what happens? Oh, I get dismayed. I was dismayed at that. You know, what's going on? What's happened? We all face these times. I think we face more of these times than the prosperous times. 
than the strong mountain times. We feel more like a sand hill times where we're just like ooh, dissolving away under the uh, rain and the storm. Um, you know, so often, you know, we pray to the Lord in those times. And, you know, we, 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 we want out of this problem. You know, we seek the Lord and go, oh, Lord, change these things. I want out and, and I want it now. Um, but so often, the Lord's answer to our prayer is not yet. He knows in his wisdom that we need more. And in those not yet times of deliverance, it feels like he's hiding his face from us. But we know that's not the actual fact. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He'll never hide himself from us. It's just how it feels. You know, again, in that messianic psalm, Psalm 22 of David, now farther down in verse 24, it says, Speaking of the Lord, For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, the afflicted person. But when that person cried to him, he heard. You know, that's the fact. We have this psalm that says, You hid your face, I was dismayed. To the psalm we just read, He hasn't despised you or hated or your affliction hasn't turned him away. He hears your prayers when you cry out to him. You know, it made me think of our brother Job. You know, um, earlier, oh, I didn't read the verse in there, but earlier uh, in verse 29 of Job, he talks about the good times. The times he had, the times when his life was solid as a mountain. When, uh, you know, he was like, uh, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll die in my own house, he said. My days will be as numerous as the grains of sand. Uh, new honors were constantly bestowed on me. I was like a tree whose roots re reached the water, you know, refreshed and renewed and, and strong. But then, wham, that trial hit. And it's as if the Lord hid his face from him. And he was in dismay. He was in sackcloth. He was in the clothes of mourning and in misery. And in those who came to help, they just added insult to injury and made things worse. And he had to, you know, he's crying out to them. He says, I used to be, you know, solid as a rock like a mountain. But now he says in the next chapter, but when I had hoped for good, evil came. And when I waited for light, Darkness came. So often we can relate to Job when it's difficult and hard. When he hides his face. It seemed like the Lord hid his face. But he was still there. He knew, God knew what he was doing. He knew what Job could handle. Oh, Lord, please don't see in me what you saw in Job. <laughs> Test what I can handle. <laughs> um... The next verse then follows along and says, To you, Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. When these hard times hit, when it seems he's not there, what do we do? Where can we go? Nowhere but to the Lord, who seems to be absent, but we know he's not. Who seems to be silent, but we know he hears. Who seems to be gone, but we know he's by our side. Who else will give us mercy? Who else can deliver us from deadly trials? Who else has faced this same type of thing and demonstrated God's power of deliverance by rising from the dead? Who else but Jesus himself? We remember him. So we cry to the Lord for help and plead for mercy. And then he says, What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? And again, he's just stating the fact. He's, 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 he's pulling out the big guns of trying to convince the Lord that, that uh, you know, he, the Lord needs to save him and get him out of this trial because he said, 
hey, if I die, you know, I can't, I can't plead to you. I can't, you won't hear from me because I won't be on earth anymore. Um, I become silent. <laughs> uh, Psalm 88 verse 10 said this, Will you show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? So it's just a picturesque way of looking like, you know, trying to convince the Lord, you got to save me now because if I die, if I go to the pit, you know, it won't be of any good to either of us. Okay, Lord, so, you know, please get me out of this. This has to do with the dedication of the temple, I'm not sure. You know what? These things are in this psalm. But remember, the temple is the place that housed the presence of the Lord. And this psalm was sung at the dedication of the temple. And, and God did demonstrate in that day that his presence was there. Glory filled that temple after Solomon's prayer. Glory was so much, his presence was so powerful that they, they, no one could go in. It was there. He didn't hide his face. They were seeking him. He was there. He would and he will deliver them from death. And he will receive their praises and desire it from them. So we come to the last section, section five. Oh, I call it, oh, how God changes things. And the key verse in this is, you have turned my mourning, which is sad mourning, into dancing. Another favorite and lovely verse from this psalm. So it ends, hear, O Lord. And be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper, for you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Now, that temple didn't last forever, it was destroyed and rebuilt. And destroyed again. But praises and thanks to God will go on forever for those who belong to Him. So it began Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. Again, this psalm has a theme of deliverance from the Lord. The Lord moving in our lives to deliver and to save us. Again, earlier, Saul, Solomon had asked for something similar. In that verse 30, the last one I said, it says this, But listen to the prayers of your servant and of your people Israel. Listen in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. When you hear, forgive. No matter what we pray, a lot of times it needs forgiveness, whether we ask for it or not. And so when the Lord, when you hear, do forgive us. And he does. Boy, that turns us from sad to glad. So that turns us, as it said in verse 11, you have turned for me my mourning, weeping, into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth, and clothe me with gladness. He praises the Lord so often by faith that deliverance will come. And that's often how our prayers in those hard times, hard times come. Now, uh, it talked about you've loosed my sackcloth Sackcloth was, other, other translations use burlap. It's scratchy, uncomfortable cloth that they would put on when they were grieving, when they were sad, when they were mourning the loss of the death of someone. Um, they would put on sackcloth. And sackcloth is itchy and uncomfortable, a constant irritation and a constant reminder of the sadness you're in. Some people put on sackcloth every day of their life, it seems. 
Some people, uh, you know, go around just, you know, like it said earlier, in mourning. But mourning, um, was, it was turned here, it said, to joyous dancing by the Lord. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. Now that word gladness means joy, pleasure. It's a, the, a happy result, a good ending to the story. Gladness is just what it says, glad. It's as if God took off from us those itchy, scratchy, irritating, miserable, uncomfortable, horrible clothes of grief and put on us luxurious silk, smooth, comfortable, satiny, soft. It's like, it's like your pajamas that you never want to get out of. Warm and cuddly and smooth and comfortable and satisfying and lovely. He takes off the clothes of grief and puts on us the silky, smooth, comfort clothes of gladness, of joy, of rejoicing. He does that. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Therefore, as the psalm ends, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. Now, the, the, this term, my glory, um, is also translated as my soul or even my tongue, my mouth. Um, psalm 16, verse 9, uses the same term. And in the ESV, it translates it in sort of a, what a better understanding. It says, Psalm 16, 9 says, Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. So that's what it means when it says, For my glory, it's like all of me, may sing your praise and not be silent. Whether we're sad or whether we're glad, we can sing his praise and should not be silent. You know, amen, we say, O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. As I said, especially the believer, we have life eternal, life everlasting, and we will give thanks to the Lord forever. So Lord, thank you that you turn our sadness into gladness. You never turn away from us. You are always with us. You deliver us. So Lord, just as the people, as they sung this song at the dedication of the temple, lifted up to this magnificent building, reminding of the much more magnificent Lord whose presence was there. So Lord, help us to always be lifting up your name, for you lift us up out of distress, and out of trouble. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Thank you, Lord, for your life. And thank you, Lord, for this song. We ask this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, God bless you, dear ones. My brothers and sisters, I hope you have a great rest of the day and a great week. And maybe we'll see you again on Sunday. God bless. Bye-bye.